Welcome to the Catholic History Show. My name is Brendan Lane, and I'm with my buddy Mike tonight. Um, we're gonna we're gonna start a series here on the Protestant Reformation tonight. As the title of the video you can see is gonna be on the myth of the divine right of kings and how that kind of comes out of the Protestant Reformation. We'll get more into that. Uh, but before I begin, um, as a kind of an intro, like I said, my name is Brendan. I'm a former high school history teacher. Um, at a Catholic uh, high school in Virginia, and um, I am a cradle Catholic. Uh, Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm a layman. Uh, I majored in, in history. I'm an amateur historian of sorts, I guess you would say, and I'm a convert to the faith. Uh, about eight years ago, I converted to the Catholic faith, and I love it, and I love talking about its history. So. Awesome. So, yeah, we came together... Um, uh, with our community and uh, we just kind of hit it off so we thought I thought hey it'd be great to have somebody else especially someone that came from a Protestant background convert to the Catholic faith um, you know because the the Reformation obviously is such a huge topic I think you'd agree right Mike it's such a huge topic uh, obviously it's a little bit controversial right a little bit controversial mm -hmm. um, even today even after 500 years so um, obviously a lot one of the comments I always get on this YouTube channel is from Protestants that don't like the stuff that I do, which is fine. Like, hey, you know, I understand that. Um, I come from the Catholic perspective. I love the Catholic Church and the Catholic faith. Um, and so anyways, I thought it'd be nice to have a, a kind of, you know, you're still Catholic, but it's a little bit different perspective coming from that. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, before we get started, we want to talk about how we have no animus to any Protestants that are out there. Like, we don't hate Protestants, you know, that's not our thing. And if it comes across that way, you know, obviously that's not our intention. Um, but what we really, what we really care about, obviously, is the truth, right? And again, before we, we get started too, a little bit, we're not theologians, and really we're not, I mean, we're amateur historians, we're not real historians. So everything that we get, everything we say is going to be, we're going to give you sources from where we're getting this stuff, right? And they're going to be actual theologians and actual historians. And the other thing is, as Catholics, we don't speak for the church, right? We're like, like you said, we're laymen. Um, and so anytime we talk about, we even get close to doctrines and dogmas, we want to make perfectly clear, we're not speaking authoritatively, obviously, for the magisterium. Um, and we're going to give you the exact quotations from what we've, what we've taken it from and the exact perspective from the sources that we've got it from. So we just want to make it clear. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, if I can add to that, I mean, I, I actually, I was raised a Protestant, and most of my family, with the exception of my aunt, who is a Catholic, my aunt's a Catholic, but with the exception of my aunt, uh, most of the rest of my family are Protestants. My uncle was a preacher, um, and I'm kind of like Dr. Steve Ray in the sense that I have I have nothing but good feelings about being raised as, uh, as a Protestant, and especially with the fact that it, um, you know, very much gave me my love for the Bible. And and got me entrenched in the scriptures at a at a very early age. So no, I mean this, but I think what it kind of came down to to uh, for me was it it really as a student of history and as somebody who loves history, the more you dig and the more you dig and the more you dig, the more you're confronted with facts. And Ben Shapiro has made it very very you know very very famous quote: "Facts don't care about your feelings," and that was sort of the conundrum that I that I eventually faced, where you know. If you're being historically on, honest, you know that you can only come up with one or two solutions. Either you become a Catholic or you become Orthodox. So um, here I am, Team Catholic. I married a beautiful Catholic woman, too, so that helped. <laughs> <laughs> that always helps. That always helps. Yeah. All right. So tonight our topic is the divine right of kings. Um, I think this is a really great place to start. I think you were really smart to start with this topic. Because the very first thing that the Reformation, that the, that the reformers, that the, the Protestants who leave the Catholic faith have to confront is the issue of authority. Right. That's really what the probably one of the first major uh, uh, issues that they have to confront is now that there is no Bishop of Rome, now that there is no Pope there to decide moral theology and to um, and to uh, use the dogmas of the church and the, the magisterial teaching to help monarchs and, and different heads of state make moral decisions or, or help them uh, make moral decisions for the populace, now you are essentially left with who makes these decisions. And it's interesting that things kind of fall apart at the seams really quick. I mean, you got the Marburg 
uh, Colloquy, where you have Luther and Zwingli really sitting down, hoping to get on the same page, have this cohesive vision going into the future, and they just can't do it, and they just can't make it work. And then Zwingli, very shortly afterward, is is confronted with the Anabaptists, who he starts putting to death in mass. And so you just have this massive divergence divergence that happens. And when you don't have the cult of personality or um, a preacher who's giving rousing uh, sermons and interpreting the Bible his way to sort of lead you, um, if you are a monarch <laughs> and you've been raised as a monarch and with all this power, it's pretty convenient to just say, well, I'm the Pope now. I make these decisions. And Henry VIII was really the first one to get that rolling. So, but I think as you're going to touch on later, uh, James VI of Scotland, later James I of England, he actually saw it to its, its fruition. So I don't know if you want to start at the beginning and, and Henry VIII and kind of roll from there and hit us with some major facts, but you're better at that than I am. Well, okay, so yeah. Um, yeah, so divine, divine Right of Kings is something obviously that is still with us today, right? The, I, it, obviously, we don't see it in the world. But it's the perspective that the vast majority of Americans, when they think about monarchy, that's what they think about, right? They think about this idea of why monarchy is bad is because you have this one executive person in control that no one has control over and they can do whatever they want to do to anybody that they want to. So you have no rights. There's no protections for the individual, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And the that existed, that did exist, like you just talked about with Henry VIII. Um, and really with obviously James I, and then on the Catholic side with Louis the Fourteenth as well, and we'll get into a little bit about that here in a minute. But but that isn't the monarchy of Christendom, right? That's not the monarchy of the Middle Ages. That didn't exist. Mm -hmm. That wasn't even a thought process, like you said, right? When you have checks and wh what was the checks and balances in the Middle Ages? It's the church, right? The church is there to protect the individual people from tyrants, right? right. Tyrants. Now the church obviously has had tyrants that existed within it. Like there have been bad bishops, there have been bad popes, there have been bad priests, right? But by and large, Christendom existed, you know, from Charlemagne all the way, I mean, you can say even up into uh, the English Reformation, so even a little bit after Luther, it existed that long based on this principle. And not everybody was living in complete slavery. Yes, did they have not they didn't have the technological advances that we have today, but a lot of our understanding of the dignity of the human person, not all a lot of it, all of it, all of it, every single iota ounce of it of the human person dignity, um, that we still in the in parts of the West care about today, it comes specifically from the divine revelation given to the apostles and passed down through the centuries to Holy Mother Church. And that was unpacked over time. And so it's, it can be very easy to like look at very specific points and be like, aha, see, the church was bad in this one instance, right? And it's yeah. just a sinner being a sinner, doing a sinful thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not making excuses for sin, right? I'm not making any excuses for that. But at the same time, you have to realize the development of the dogmas really is what brought about this this amazing transformation in in how human beings viewed each other and how yeah. they treated each other. And that all yeah. came from Christ. Christ is obviously always a source, but Christ right. uses his church to bring that to future generations. And so I think that's kind of a that's that's the position that we take as Catholics towards the divine right of kings. Like when you look at when you look at monarchy, right? And you just say, oh, we, we need we need to get rid of monarchy because monarchy is evil, because it takes away rights of people. That's a misunderstanding of essentially all monarchies up until the 16th, 17th century, right? Yes. Have there been despots? Yes. Have there been tyrants in human history? Probably quite a few of them. But the idea that, that um, the form of government that we have now is inherently better than what they had in the Middle Ages, yeah, I think is, is a great detriment to our, our psyche, our national psyche in a lot of ways, because we don't get the opportunity to really understand where our heritage comes from, which is the good part of our heritage comes from Christendom, if that makes sense. So Yeah, um, well, and then the fact that um, you didn't have, first, you didn't have as much of an opportunity for um, tyranny in, uh, in society prior to this for the sheer fact that, first of all, you have writings as early as Augustus, St. Augustus in the 400s, 
writing about tyrannicide and when it's moral to overthrow uh, a head of state. And that carries on all the way through to uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas. So, I mean, the laity and the people were very aware that this was something that could happen. But beyond all that, uh, you had a united West, you had a, a Western Europe that was at times quarreling with itself and was at times fighting amongst themselves, but you always had that moral check of the church there in place. So if a leader got too out of control and, and became a despot, you had this moral authority that was there that the leader was beholden to, uh, and he would have to answer for his crimes. And there's a, you know, chances are, especially with the Holy Roman Empire and the way that it existed, you know, if push came to shove, the Pope would probably put together some sort of, uh, conglomerate of armies to put a stop to it. Um, but when Henry VIII decides that he just has to have this divorce, and he just he just has to have this divorce, and, and it's his only possibility to have an heir, and, and he breaks from the church, you now have this very dangerous seed planted in Western Europe that wasn't there before. You have this monarch, this head of state that goes rogue and declares himself the head of a church, and all of hundreds of years, or thousand at least over a thousand years of of teaching in western europe up to this point it's contrary to that you know the church is the, the moral authority of society and if a leader goes outside of that the people know that there's a chance that that will be checked well now henry the eighth is in the driver's seat and he's calling the shots and it all sort of seems to go downhill from there yeah no i, I think that's a great point and that really brings into the historical aspect right so you have these checks and balances that exist now is it all Henry VIII's fault? No, of course it's not all his fault. What he did, obviously, was horrendous and awful um, by breaking with the church. But what you have to understand, so there's a lot of history involved in this, and the War of the Roses obviously plays a major role in this. Right? Henry VIII was never supposed to be the king of England. He was never supposed to be the king of England. His brother dies, so he has to take the throne. His father is Henry VII. Neither one of them are, I mean, okay, so people will disagree with us in England. And that's fine. I'm an American. I don't have any right to talk about your monarchy. I'm just no dog leader. in the race. <laughs> you know, like, I'm just a bystander looking. No at dog him. in the race. Yeah. He, 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 they're not legitimate, right? After the War of the Roses is over, Henry VII, the Tudors, I mean, yes, okay, they're sort of legitimate, but they're not, they're not super legitimate. There's probably better people that should be on the throne. Um and so, like you said, he needs a male heir because he looks at the Henry VIII looks at the historical perspective and he's like, uh, no offense to women, but their monarchies are usually pretty weak. And there's already so much turmoil taking place in my country. I need a strong male heir to be able to survive the Tudor dynasty. And I think this is a really important point because he was so short sighted. He was so short-sighted. I think if Henry VIII were sitting in a room and you could sit him down and he wasn't the pompous version of himself that we all know and mm -hmm. and kind of despise, we, he would probably be able to admit, like, look, your country is going to be destroyed by this, right? There's going to be hundreds of thousands of, of just complete, just complete mayhem, right? Because of what you're about to do, because you want to keep the Tudor line in fact, and he didn't want a civil war. He was trying to avoid what happened in the War of the Roses. He was trying to avoid that bloodshed. And so, like, for that, you can say, okay. But when you violate the commands of God, right, what you what he did, taking Catherine of Aragon on as his wife after his brother died, was a good thing, right? That was a good thing. And then trying to get rid of her because he didn't have a male heir, um, it just, obviously, it's not acceptable. It's, it wasn't right. And so, in any event... The consequence of that was what you said. He now takes control of the church and the state. That's that has caused centuries now, centuries of turmoil. And it's we can see, you know, the fruit of that even in our own country with this this ideology, like this belief, this strongly held belief by both not just conservatives but liberals too of the separation of church and state, how this is a mm -hmm. good thing. And it's like yeah. it's not a good thing. Like we need to have our faith uh in, guiding us in how we make political decisions. In any event, the point is Henry VIII breaks. He takes on control of church and state. So now, like you said, there's no checks and balances. Um, now, he gets his male heir in Edward, and Edward is uh, weak, and he dies pretty quick. And he, it's actually kind of funny because if you read the histories of Edward, 
he's completely controlled by his ministers, right? Like mm-hmm. he's just a weakly little young guy. Yeah. Um, and he just, it's, it's not an effective monarchy. Then you get Mary and we're going to swing back into Catholicism, right? She's mm-hmm. going to reunify with what the church of Rome and all the rest of it. It's going to, the bloody Mary, right? Which obviously yep. is ethical. We can talk about that if we go through the English reformation. Yeah. I think, then, uh, I think 300 max, and then we can look at how many were executed past that. Right. And again, yeah. we have to we have to consider the concept of what a state execution was. It was right. done right. by the state. You know what I mean? This they had very, very, very aggressive punishments for even minor infractions in society back then. Yeah, so. I mean, you didn't, you didn't have mass prison populations, right? Like, right. you know, you steal two times, you commit you commit a felony mm-hmm. theft two times, they're going to execute you, right? You get one on theft, on theft, right? Anyways, so. After Mary, you get Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth, interesting, because she's illegitimate for both Protestants and Catholics. Everybody thinks she's illegitimate, right? Except the Cecils, right? I'm trying to gloss over a lot of this history, but I'm trying to show how this devolved, because as the ministers became more and more powerful within the government, there was eventually going to come a, a point of tension, right? Essentially, you had a deep state taking place in England in the Tudor monarchy. So then after, after Elizabeth... Um, we get James the first, like you said, and he's the one who really defines this idea of the divine right of kings. Now, again, is it James the first, his entire, his fault? Really not, not so much, right? Like he was, this was already happening around him. He's the one who gets credit for it because he puts it down on paper and he dresses parliament and says, hey guys, these are my rights. Now, like you said, it's not going to last very long. Because guess what? When you have a deep state, if you will, in England at the time, where you have these very powerful um, parliamentary lords that have been given, granted all this money from the the um, the con- confiscation of all the monasteries by Henry VIII, and it was handed out to all these guys, they're worried about losing those things. And that's why the Catholicism issue is such a big deal in mm-hmm. England. So they want to maintain their control. James is saying... I'm in control. And they're fine with that because they're like, he's a Protestant. He's going to do, he's going to keep, we're going to, everything's going to be status quo. Everything's good. But the problem comes about when you have a Catholic or a Catholic friendly, friendly monarch that's going to come to the throne. And he says, Hey guys, I'm in complete control. And then they're going to be like, hold on a second. Wait yeah. a minute. Wait a minute. Are you going to take our land from us and give back to the church? Cause we stole it from them, like, right. Years ago. And yeah. then you get the, one of the worst destructions in English history, which is the English Civil War, and the disaster. I mean, literally the hundreds of thousands of people that die in Ireland as a result of it, right? To the genocide that takes place in Ireland with Cromwell. You know, that's a direct result of this. Hey guys, I'm the only one in control until the deep state's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, we don't we don't want you in control. And so they cause a civil war. Anyways, so we, we should talk a little bit more about um, James. I'm gonna read a quote from James I, so that's okay? Yeah, do it. All right. I think I'm going to read a quote from James I. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, James I, uh, he addresses Parliament, and he says, quote, the state of monarchy is the highest thing upon earth, for kings are not only God's lieutenants and sit upon God's throne, but even God himself calls them gods. And there he's referring to, uh, he's referring mm. to Psalms. But mm. then he goes on to say, I conclude then this point touching the power of kings with this statement of divinity that to argue with what God may do is blasphemy. So is it sedition in subjects to dispute what a king may do in the height of his power. End quotation. Yeah. This is an incredibly dangerous precedent to <clears throat> set, right? Yeah. Like you're telling everybody, I'm essentially God for you guys. So don't disagree with me because if you disagree with me, I'm gonna have to kill you right yeah and well and kind of like with Zwingli I mean Zwingli in, in Switzerland uh decides that this is the truth and this is what the Bible says and then when there's any plurality of thought people start getting killed really quick <laughs> really quickly and that's the scary thing is that we see in the fruition of the divine right of kings for the very first time we see a we see monarchs with unchecked power we see monarchs no longer beholden to a greater moral authority because the way that the society was structured was that the church was the greater moral authority than the monarchs. That's why Henry, Henry VIII has to ask the Pope to get a uh, divorce in the first place. 
If he could have just divorced his wife and he had that power beholden to him, he wouldn't have needed it. But, you know, it's it's hilarious to me because uh, in the later tracks that come out um, defaming Catholicism and the 17 and the 1800s that were proliferated widely through Western society in England and the United States and things like that, there's a lot of this talk of the Pope as this dictator and the Pope as this antichrist, you know, despot that rules with an iron fist and and holds Europe back from its full potential with, with, you know, with this unchecked power. And what you actually see, when you actually study the papacy and what the Pope is, the Pope is beholden to the unchanging dogmas of the church. The Pope is beholden to the magisterial teaching of the church. And the Pope is beholden to the natural law, which is the biggest one. And this is, when you read that statement from James I, it's so contrary to the natural law, it's almost unbelievable. Because the way the society was structured prior to this, prior to the, the rise of these divine, of the divine right of kings and things like this, was that you had the first society, which was the family, and you had the inherent dignity of those individuals within the family. And then society was seen uh, structured around the family to a greater extent as a collection of families under a leader that they gave consent to lead them on some level. Um, and so the, the first thing that you see is this immediate loss of of, of uh, any sort of rights or any sort of uh, potential for the regular people to have a voice or to even push back if things go out of control. And, the, you know, that's, that's where this gets so rough. You know, and like you pointed out, I mean, from the, once it got rolling, because we had proto-reformers prior to this, we had the Lollards and, and um, you know, different groups like that. Um, the uh, Waldensians and stuff like that, but it never really got r rolling because uh, the heresies were seen, the papacy was still res respected, and, and these movements got put down. Um, but once it gets going, and once the local lords get involved, and once they start seizing this church property and this mo these monasteries, which are big money makers and 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 you know have spent hundreds of years establishing a product that they make or, or tilling the land, or it's just wealthy property to begin with. Once those Lords can seize that, make it their own and start making money off of it themselves. And then once these monarchs get put at the top and can start taxing everybody down below and they make money off of it, there's no motivation at that point now to go back under the authority of the church. There's no motivation to go back under the initial agreement, which is that there's a higher moral authority other than yourself who's been elected by God and he himself is beholden to that authority, so he can't get too out of control either. So, I don't know. No, you you nailed it, right? I think that's that's a key point. That's a key uh, misunderstanding that exists in in the history of the Reformation, which is specifically, right? It's not to say that there's many reformers that actually believed, obviously, what they did. There's a lot of people that heard the reformers and they thought, hey, that makes sense. Um, and they're trying to, they were, they thought that they were doing God's will, right? But the reason that the Reformation succeeded and continued, and the reason that Protestantism exists today is because the, uh, the Lords, like you said, the Lords, the political leaders of the time saw it as an opportunity to enrich themselves and to gr essentially a power grab. And that's what divine right of Kings is. Yep. It's a power grab. That's yep. what it is. It's. I, it's something that is completely contrary, like you said, to the teachings of Christendom. And second, I'm going to read a quote from Augustine. It's but it's presented later as this piousness. It's presented la later as this piety against uh, this absolutely corrupt entity in the church that was ruining society. And was there corruption in the church at the time? Absolutely. Yep. And I mean, well, I'm sure we'll have to do an entire video on the Counter-Reformation and the, and the necessity for it and, and why it, it had to happen. But again, in the church, you're talking about a 2,000-year-old institution. So there have been times of corruption, and there's been times of great blossoming. And, and, Christ, and Christ has always brought the ship back to where it needed to be when it's gone too far this way or too far that way. Um, but it's, it's always it struck me very much, especially growing up in the Protestant um, community, that you, know, you have to have the Catholic Church as this great boogeyman. And you have to believe the basic stories that are presented to you about it being this great big man and about it being this great, uh, this great um, enemy of, of freedom and of personal choice and things like that. Because 
as long as you accept those notions on 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 their head and and don't do any actual uh, research into it, then it's fine. And that's why the Catholic Church has to be the boogeyman and 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 the great enemy. But when you actually start to study it, you realize that this actually wasn't a pious endeavor. So for the, maybe some of the people who started it, or maybe some of the early believers of Luther and Zwingli, it was pious, and they were true believers of it. But like like we pointed out, when the lords get involved, uh, it becomes really cynical. Now it becomes yeah. extremely cynical because they've been chomping at the bit to expand their expand their estates and expand their power, and now they have it. Yeah, you're exactly right. And the English Reformation really, in a big way, is kind of, it's it, it, the reason it gets its own Reformation. I mean, there's several, right? We're going to talk about the English Reformation. Yeah. We're going to talk about the Scottish Reformation. Um, but the reason the English Reformation really stands out from, you know, what we talk about with Luther and Calvin is because it was almost entirely driven by political gain, right? From Henry VIII and two until his, and, and then his administrators later, right? You get Thomas Cromwell, who not to be confused with his nephew, his great great nephew Oliver Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell, wonderful, the guy, the wonderful guy, guy by the way. Uh, <laughs> wonderful guy, by the way, Oliver yeah, Cromwell. Yeah, guy, great guy. Yeah. We love him. No, um, not accurate. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, like Thomas Cromwell is is almost completely driven by political gain, and that's I mean that's why Saint Thomas More had to die. Right. Political gain. He wasn't going to do anything. What was he going to do? He's like, I, I'm not the chancellor anymore. I'll go live. Mm -mm, we got to kill him. We got to kill him. Right. Cool. Because it was you have to have essentially everyone in agreement with something that everyone kind of knows isn't probably right. Right. That right. was it. You had to have you had to have this consistency. And um, so you had to cancel people. And the way they used to cancel people back in the old days was they just cut their heads off. You know, it was a lot, yeah, a lot simpler back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, well, and, uh, and I mean, no, I mean, like, like you point out, I mean, how uh, when we take into account the fact that uh, Henry VIII wrote disputations against Luther when he started his revolution, which that's the thing, that is another difference between us and Protestants. They call it a reformation. We consider the reformation to have happened during the counter reformation. All of the, you know, all of the corruptions were essentially corrected, at least for the time being. Um, and yeah, we moved on with with our Catholic history. But so us uh, Catholics considered basically revolution. So when when Luther launched his revolution, uh, Henry VIII was such a great friend of the papacy and such a true believer of a Catholic. He actually wrote a disputation against Luther's heresies and condemned them. And then we find after he makes his political power play to get what he wants, like you pointed out, um, we find his initial religion, uh, it, it differs in no substantial way from, he was actually very liturgically conservative. I mean, you basically just have Catholicism with him getting what he wanted to accomplish politically, and uh, that's it. You know, you don't have any of like Zwingli denying the real presence of the Eucharist or, you know, any of, of Luther's you know, uh, sola scriptura, sola fide, none of that. It's it's blanket Catholicism with him getting to have accomplished what he wanted and then seizing all the church lands and making money off of it. So that, right. alone, should, that alone should tell you the motives. I mean, how is that not enough to know the motive? Yeah, and then when you understand the confiscation of the monasteries on top of that, right? So how do you get all the Catholics to go along with this, or at least the Catholics in power to go along with this? Is right. You have to pay them. You have to pay them off. Or you have yeah. to kill them, right? right? Those are the two ways. You're you're gonna tell me that everyone's like, oh yeah, okay, this makes sense, right? We we've been taught our whole lives that divorce and remarriage isn't a good thing, and then the king can just give himself an annulment, and they're all gonna be like, okay, yeah, good, let's go, let's do that. <laughs> no, yeah. he had to pay them off. How does he pay them off? He takes it's the largest land grab, it's the largest property grab. You want to talk about property rights? You want to talk about property rights? Yeah. Let's talk about what happened to the monasteries in 1538. When Henry yeah. just said, mm, mine now, mine, so I can hand it out to the people that I owe. And, and let's talk, them. yeah, and let's talk about what that did to society, because there were large swaths of the poor who were, who were totally reliant on these monasteries for their charitable acts to be fed, to be clothed. I mean, these monasteries didn't operate as, uh, you know, they didn't operate as, as big businesses. They were out to make a profit, they were out to serve God, so they were serving the local community. I mean... You know, why do you think there's the old adage of uh, when there's an orphan born or the mother dies and there's no father, they drop it off at the monastery, the, mon the monks raise it. 
You know, I mean, that's yeah. that's not a joke. That's a real thing that happened in Europe. And, and it was a real safety net for the European community. They knew they had it. And when these mega powers, when when uh, when the elite, you might call them nowadays, certainly they're the elite. When the elite start to land grab all of these monasteries and turn them at least start to tax them for profit like they did, uh, it goes away. Yep. You know, yep. the, uh, the community no longer has a safety net. And. And there's never been any official studies on it done, but in England, they reckon a lot of people starved and, and, and a lot of people suffered, which is actually what led, you know, later on to the uprising with the Northern English and stuff like that. I mean, some of these people got downright so upset and mad watching their families go hungry, watching their loved ones suffer. And, you know, from a pious standpoint, watching their religion be uh, ruined, that they actually yeah. took the arms early on against Henry. So, yeah, yeah. yeah there, there were quite a few rebe- there were quite a few rebellions against this throughout from from henry the eighth all the way through elizabeth and even after that i mean you could go all the way obviously to bonnie prince charlie after james the second and yeah so yeah there there was still there were still plenty of people that were not okay with this and they were not you know the vast majority of people this was not in in england specifically yeah this was not some like great uprising of the people they were all yeah. Catholic. they all yes. saw themselves as catholic they thought it was kind of weird what the king was doing yeah. but like the vet, they all saw themselves as just being, yeah, we're Catholics. That's what we are. And um, so there's, again, there's so many misconceptions when you talk about the Reformation. And, well, when, but, they, when, they, when they take away your monastery, monasteries, when they destroy your priests, and when your priests are the ones who can write to the Pope and say there's corruption going on in our country, you need to do something, you need to condemn this Lord, or you need to threaten this monarch with excommunication because he's abusing the people. When that gets taken away, and when and when the priests that are left, who are still a part of the Catholic faith, have to go underground and hide all of a sudden, what voice do the people have? No wonder, no wonder it finally took hold. I mean, you know, it it was such it was such pressure. Now all of a sudden, you're going to be put to death. Or uh, Queen Elizabeth starts in really quick with, uh, "Oh, you want to stay Catholic?" Because a lot of people wanted to stay Catholic. Oh, you want to stay Catholic? Well, you as a family are going to be taxed if you don't attend the Anglican Mass. Yep. And if you're poor already and you've had your monasteries taken away that provide you with at least some food and some income, what are you left with? But uh, another thing that I wanted to slip in really, really quickly is one thing that I, I'm so glad you started with this topic, especially the English Reformation, because it's just so it's so incredibly cynical when you look at it with its reasonings, like we were pointing out. And when you look at Luther and you look at Zwingli, I would argue when you really look at what went on with Luther and Zwingli, um, it's actually somewhat cynical in and of itself too, but at least there's a surface authenticity to claiming the Catholic Church is heretical and to claiming that the Catholic Church has fallen into heresy and that we need to course correct and we need to come back to the one true faith. At least there's like a surface honesty and authenticity to that. But to keep the liturgy, to keep the sacraments, to keep everything, you know, theologically the same, but just get your divorces and seize church property. Come on. Come on. What do you do with that? No, I I agree with you. I agree with you 100% because it's, that's, that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of my point. (laughs) That's why I, I, we're not really focusing on Luther at this point, right? When we're talking about divine right of Kings, because it's so clearly seen. The, yeah. the Luther part of it, it, you're like you said, it still exists to a certain extent, especially later on. But you're right, not at first. Not at first. I think Luther really was trying to do, was trying to reform. Like he thought there, he saw something that was bad and he was trying to do reform. It got way out of control. He got way off the reservation. Um, and the same thing with Zwingli. But, but when he first started, he saw, he saw an issue and he was like, this this doesn't make sense. This can't be right. This isn't consistent right. with church teaching. Right. Um, and so, but the problem that Luther had was just to have a little sidebar. The problem Luther had was instead of realizing that these were bad, there were there were certain bad men. Not all the ones he accused of being bad were bad. They weren't. But yeah. there were certain bad men that were abusing a good thing. And instead of saying the church has already recognized that here's the good. And these guys are clearly abusing it. Instead of saying that, he's saying, no, the church, they they, have, they hold the position of what the abusers are doing. And that's where he that's where he went. 
he went haywire. I'm, so, I'm excited. I, I'm excited for when we get to the Luther video. Luther's kind of my favorite character. I think, um, we're, gonna, I think <laughs> we're gonna have to do probably a couple on Luther yeah. because oh, he, yeah, it's we'll just too part, big of a at least the part one and the part two. At least the part yeah. one and the part two. Yeah, part because two. I think with Luther, I think while you're correct, um, uh, you know that that he did have good points. Of course, uh, you got to do a deep dive into into the psychology of Luther and to his background and to. You know, apparently, and, and again, we'll get more to it later, but just to touch on it, apparently Luther would spend hours in the confessional booth and tie up a confessor for hours because he felt like he still wasn't being forgiven. And he felt like he was still being condemned by God. So, uh, and apparently it was, uh, it was the fact that he almost died in a horrible storm and he promised God that he would serve his church if God would save him from the storm that even led him into the religious life to begin with. So I, I would think you could argue that it wasn't an honest entering into the priesthood or to the religious life to begin with. But with Luther, and I think this plays very much into um, uh, sola fide, into, uh, into by faith alone, with, with Luther, you, you seem to have this very troubled man with this very troubled conscience who feels like God is constantly going to strike him down. And he, you know, the, the Catholic concept of both faith and works work out your uh, own, you know, work out your salvation through fear and trembling when you're already in deep fear and already trembling and already think God's going to condemn you for everything. It's kind of a natural bridge to, well, we're all saved by faith alone. So it really doesn't matter what you do that much. As long as you have faith, that will save you. And so to me, sola fide is actually a, uh, it's actually a doctrine of a man very much in fear in fear of dying and in fear of God. Yeah, no, I, I have a healthy I, fear of God, but not to that extent. <laughs> no, I agree. I think I think that's those are good. They're very good points. But I didn't mean to take us off topic. Back to the divine right of kings, James the yeah. Sorry. So no, yeah. So uh, yeah. So James James the first he gets credited with this whole divine right of things from a historical perspective. Obviously, from you know your vast majority of people perspective, they just think all kings are like that, right? Now another point I kind of wanted to get to uh, before we closed was so. The Enlightenment, right? In America, we have this great love for the Enlightenment. We love John Locke. We love Adam Smith. We love even Hume. We love all these Enlightenment thinkers. The Enlightenment is a response to the divine right of kings, right? It's not a response to Christendom because Christendom had been, you know, it wasn't there anymore. Like this, like what we're talking about, this separate, this separation. No, I'm sorry. This check on the political spectrum on the monarchy, on the lords, by the church, that was gone. So yeah. now you had no one checking the monarchy. Guess what happens? It gets completely out of control. Yep. And so then you have these thinkers that are like, well, this isn't right. And they were right. The problem is the Enlightenment is the wrong solution to an actual problem, which is the divine right of kings. And we'll talk about the Enlightenment, um, obviously, coming up, because many Protestants, obviously, were Enlightenment thinkers. Um, you're not going to find a lot of Catholics that were Enlightenment thinkers because it's not consistent with the teachings of the church. We um, thought it was good the way that it was. <laughs> that's right. They're like, yeah. we, could just, we could just go back to, you know, we just go back to the way that it was. We did. Yeah. But no, they, so, so we'll talk about the Enlightenment in the future, but the Enlightenment is response to divine right of things, right of kings. That's why we, in America today, we still have this like uh, reservation about the monarchy. It's because we only understand it from the lens of the divine right of kings. And like we were trying to point out, this isn't, this obviously wasn't Luther's intention with divine right of kings, but this is a result of what Luther starts, right? It's a result of this, this protestation against the church. Because yeah. like we said, when you remove the church, there's a vacuum. Guess yeah. who, who goes into the vacuum? The biggest and the strongest. And that yeah. was the kings at the time. And so they're like, yeah. hey, we're in control now. Well, and who did Luther look for uh, protection from? Lords, government, the state. Anybody who was powerful, who had a private military that could protect him, is very much who now Luther becomes beholden to extremely early on. And there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on with that. Like there's a guy, there's a uh, there's a a German lord who marry who wants to marry two uh, two ladies, and obviously that didn't jive with Catholicism, and obviously it didn't jive with Luther. But he just kind of quietly gives his approval, his, his wink and his nod, because this, this guy was a very, very powerful lord with a very, very powerful private military who'd done a lot of um, who'd done a lot of favors and a lot of protecting of Luther. So when you don't have that check of magisterial teaching, of um, 
dogmas that are unchanging within the church that have been worked out over councils, both East and West, over 1,500 years up to that point, and of the natural law. When you don't have those bindings, what are you beholden to? You're beholden to civil authorities. So naturally, what happens? Civil authorities rise straight to the top. They become powerful. And actually, I wanted to touch on this before we move on and before we move into James, uh, James I. The church had already combated this. In the 6th century, if you look at the Byzantine Caesaro papacy, if you look at the, the so-called Byzantine popes within the church, um, after the Western Roman Empire falls, it's beholden to the Eastern Roman Empire. And even though it's pretty well understood from early church writings, and if the Orthodox, if any of them are watching, are going to totally come at me on this one, because the papacy is one of the things, of course, that, that we dispute. But um, I have a good Orthodox friend who converted to Catholicism who would argue them back. So but that's neither here nor there. But um, after, the Western, after the Western Roman Empire falls, the Western Roman Empire is restored by uh, the Eastern Empire, and they become politically and militarily beholden to the Eastern Roman Empire. And the way things had kind of run for quite some time in the East was uh, the, the bishop of Constantinople was very much tied in with the king and with uh, whoever was running the Eastern Roman Empire at the time was, and was basically, you can argue, was elected uh, sort of politically more so than, than the way that the church had it set up. Um, so they actually start electing popes for the Western Empire. And that's where you get these Byzantine popes that run through the sixth century. And the church, and especially the pope, understanding his unique place among the churches and understanding the fact that he had to have this sense of independence in order to truly teach authoritatively on these moral matters and these theological matters within the church, and that he couldn't be beholden to this government or this military that was protecting him, they reach out to who? The Franks. And who do we get? that comes in and fills that vacuum militarily, but we get Charlemagne and we get the beginning of the Holy, Ro Holy Roman Empire. So we had already gone through this. You know, this has already happened. It had already been imposed on the church and the church found its way out of it and found its way back to its autonomy, found its way back to its teaching and its moral authority so that it could be that as Western Europe rebuilt itself up until the point to the 1500s when the revolution and the, the reformers do away with it all. Up until, yeah. the point, up until the point that Henry VIII has to have his divorce. Uh, sorry, it's very cynical. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's true, right? It, it's an accurate statement. And so, okay, so to kind of finish the James the first part, um, and this is, I'm trying to give James the first a little bit of benefit of the doubt. James the first, not my favorite monarch, not the worst monarch, not my favorite monarch. <laughs> not, I mean, Anyways, he the one of the one of the truisms I guess you can say about civilization is it's not me saying this is what Chesterton said. So there you go. Uh, one of the truisms about civilization is the more complex it becomes, the more necessary for authoritative government that takes place, right? And so James the first was being faced with it, it, this is little old Mary England turning into an empire. And as England grew, now obviously they didn't, they were not at their height yet of power. France is still the main power. Spain, obviously, they got truckloads of gold coming in. But England was starting to kind of come onto the scene. And as they become more powerful, there needs to more there needs to be a more centralized government, right? Like if you look in the United States of America, it's a perfect example. We start out as a very agrarian, 13 colonies that kind of come together. We don't need as strong of a, a centralized government. And as the years go on, you need somebody at the, you know, making decisions um, for more com more complex decisions. Obviously, there's, uh, there, we've gone way too far past that. <laughs> you know? yeah. But, but what I'm saying is, as civilizations grow and become more complex, you need more centralized authority. And so James I was kind of he was doing a couple of things. He obviously believed this as you know the king. He believed he was divinely appointed by God that he was going to be. You know, I'm here as king, so uh, God wants me to be king, and he doesn't want you to be king, and he wants Why me to be king. Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? And and so the so he's he's kind of working all this out when he addresses Parliament with this. And like I said, Parliament for the most part is okay with this at the time because James the First, he's a good he's a good Protestant. Um, a little bit more about James the First, he was baptized Catholic by Mary Queen of Scots. 
Um, but then obviously when she gets arrested, James gets taken away from her and he's raised by Protestants and he converts to Protestantism. He's taught why, how evil Catholicism is. And he remains Protestant his whole life and, you know, um, until he dies and he's got other issues. But he really looked at the world and saw it as like, well, this is, this obviously is what God wants for my kingdom. This is what is true because this is what's been going on since, obviously, like you said, since Henry VIII, there is no one really to check him. Mm -hmm. And it, it results in his successor in Charles I literally losing his head, right? Like he doesn't make it, he doesn't, he, from the moment Charles um, takes or is, is assuming the throne, parliament immediately is ready to put a check on him, right? They don't, they were, they say, okay, look, the duties and the customs that are supposed to go to you, um, that are, that have gone to every king's in, in perpetuum, like forever, we're not going to grant those to you unless you agree to call a parliament every year. And he said, absolutely not. You don't have a right to demand that. You're supposed to grant these to me as parliament. Like, this is a custom. You're just supposed to do this. They're like, we're not my doing dad, that My dad said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like, and so then he abolishes the thing. And then, and then it, it turns into, right, you have the, the rebellion in Scotland. And then he's got to deal with France on the, on the other side of that. And it's, it, it causes, in essence, a complete breakdown in the government because Parliament is refusing to grant him the, the duties and customs that are ordered to the king to defend the kingdom. And it leads to an, an intense civil war that spans over a decade. Not just, it spans multiple continents, right? It affected, every, it affected the colonies here in America. There was an Indian massacre that took place in Virginia because of the civil war taking place in England. And so... I mean, thousands of people lost their lives. Yeah. Eventually, they get Cromwell, and that's a complete disaster. So in any event, you can see the policy of divine right of kings is an incredibly dangerous policy. It's not inherent to the teachings of the Catholic Church. Uh, it doesn't come from the teachings of the Catholic Church. It comes from, in essence, it, it really doesn't even come from a reformer. It comes from the vacuum that's created when you remove the influence of the church from the controlling the government in a, in a sense right like they're not from morally the from morally uh directing it or from morally exactly. or from, from keeping the government morally in check you know right. via right. the magisterial teachings and and 2000 or at that point 1500 years of of christendom so yeah i mean what's to stop you right exactly exactly there's no there's nothing left to stop you and so um so we'll get, well, as we go forward, we'll talk a lot more about um, a lot of these kind of uh, philosophies and obviously the history behind a lot of this stuff um, in other videos that we're going to do. And um, next, next time we're going to talk about capitalism and the myths surrounding capitalism and Protestantism. And um, so that'll be exciting. And then after that, we're actually, I think if it's all right with you, Mike, we're going to actually start talking about uh, like the actual dates, history of the Reformation. I just kind of wanted to use these myths as yeah. examples before we got into that stuff, right. how it affects us today, right? Like this isn't right. just an arbitrary discussion about, well, you know, uh, 500 years ago, there was this guy Luther and he did these things. Isn't that interesting? No, this like this, this still we're having consequences in our civilization today. Yep. And, and as a, as a cradle Catholic, revert Catholic, um, like, this is important for Catholics, right? We, I wasn't raised, maybe you Catholics out there were raised this way. We, I didn't really know there was, what the difference was between Protestants and Catholics. I knew they didn't have the mass. I knew they didn't have the Pope. But other than that, it was kind of like, oh, they're Christians too. It's the same thing. And again, this is not, we don't, we don't hate Protestants, but we have to understand the fundamental differences really in our, on our worldview and our perspective of how we view, um, everything around us and and a lot of that can can come from uh the the protestant ideology the philosophy that was was even that was prevalent even in luther's time and like uh, divine right of King, kings is a perfect example of that 90 uh, percent of the information you're going to get growing up um even as a catholic in the united states when it concerns the reformation is going to be from a protestant slant yep, and it's, right. uh, yeah and that's the thing uh, you cannot escape it it's written into the uh, the older history books at least now the newer history books probably have a marxist slant but uh the older history books at least had like a puritanical slant that presented the reformation as this total net positive and as this almost this uh this preceding event leading up to uh american independence 
And that's what's so clever about what was done in uh, in the tracks that were put out in the 19th century and the 1800s that made their way through England and into America and stuff like that is it very much played on this extreme American, not extreme, but this uh, inherent, I have it, you have it, yep. uh, this inherent American ideal of independence and of freedom. And in order to have uh, attained independence and attained freedom, you have to attain it from something. You have to attain it from this giant greater power that was oppressive. And in the puritanical sense and in the Protestant American sense, that had to be the Catholic Church. Because when you really get into the minutia of the issues and when you really get into the historical facts of the issues, as we pointed out, a lot of it's much more cynical. A lot of it's uh, driven by money, driven by power, driven by political expediency, uh, driven by the power grabs like we talked about. Um, and you can't present that to people who won their independence from England. You can't. <laughs> because it won't resonate. It won't work. So we're the byproducts of, you know, a hundred or so, hundred and hundred and fifty years or so of 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 only hearing one side of the story. And that's why I think these conversations are important. And any conversations that go on in the comments section are important because there 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 is two sides to this story. And if you really, really are honest historically, you're and you really look into it. Just, I challenge you. I challenge anyone. Look into it trying to, to disprove the Catholic Church. I've done it several times. Try to look into it trying to disprove the Catholic Church and, and look into it historically honestly and, and let's see what you come away with. So that's my challenge to everybody on here. Awesome. All right. So uh, that's a great – that's where we're going to end it today. That's all right with you, Mike. Um, so in the, in, the, in the description section, I'm going to leave several sources, actually I think five sources. Uh, if you want to learn more about the stuff we talked about today, uh, maybe in the future we'll highlight, like we'll do like a little end of the thing if people are interested in that for like, hey, check out this source and here's why it's good sort of a deal. Um, but in any event, please subscribe to the channel, like the video. Like Mike said, comment. If you hate us, comment. That's great. That actually helps us in the algorithm. More people will see the video. Comment. That's fine. Share it. Um, oh, and there's a bell. Click the bell. Click the bell. Um, and that will tell you when we make new videos, which will be very soon, hopefully, but I'll let you know. Um, we're going to work on like a social media thing uh, in the future, so we'll get that out to y'all. Um, and please, uh, we thank you. Uh, share it with anyone that you want. And uh, until next time, God bless. Prove us strong. <laughs>